Welcome to another episode of Sync Riffs. My name is Charles from Blue Buddha Entertainment. In the studio, I have a very special guest joining me, Angela Leas, SVP from Universal Films. Good afternoon, Angela. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yes, we've been uh, busy this week. It's uh, AAPI month, and you were gracious uh, to be on our second inaugural panel, and we had a great, robust chat with our panelists. And so we don't repeat that information. Wanted to have you on the podcast as a, a companion piece to bookend your amazing career uh, over a decade at Universal Films, working on projects like Cocaine Bear, the Trolls franchise, Jordan Peele's Us and Nope, Straight Out Compton, Compton and, and Joe Coy's Easter Sunday, to name a few, but would love to unpack the sort of the state of the industry. We have all these existential factors happening, artificial intelligence, but Universal, in 2023, you guys, your box office numbers, you guys have a pulse on what types of films consumers want to mm -hmm. consume. So yeah. what's, you know, threading that needle, the culture of Universal, because I know you were recognized um, this year, Women in Music 2024 Billboard, and you had a great quote that I had read online about the diversity of culture and the storytelling at Universal. If you want to spend yeah. some time on that. Yeah, I mean, look, it, you know, it's a really good through line with it being AAPI month. Um, I think Universal, for a really long time now, not just because, you know, it was like the cool thing to do after like the Me Too movement of like, you know, hiring and like working with, you know, creators um, that are really diverse. It's been something that has been at the forefront of the company for a really long time. I think a lot of that has to do with like the leadership. Um, you know, I feel very fortunate to work at a company that has a lot of females you know, in leadership roles, diverse females in leadership roles. Um, and it really permeates through the culture in terms of just, you know, the awareness, but also um, the thoughtfulness and the importance that's, you know, that is put into making sure that diversity is a really big part of the entire culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about uh, you know, I'm coming up on almost 14 years in January, which is really crazy. And, you know, I've been really lucky to have participated in a lot of like, you know, diversity kind of leadership training. And that's something that Universal does a lot, particularly for, you know, like kind of middle management. I mean, they do it at all levels. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I did this, you know, thing that was like very much focused on um being an AAPI and what that means in your career and so it was like you know really eye opening to be able to have leadership training like that and then also it's just about like the filmmakers that i think we attract you know mm. um we're not very much about like what the cool thing is what whether it's like at the time when there was like all of the superhero movies like you know that were at the forefront of like the box office we've always stayed true to the fact that like there's something for everybody you know like we always talk about how like we have movies of all shapes and sizes and whether it's like a blumhouse you know small budget horror film or a focus art house film or you know like a big four quadrant um movie like Jurassic or Fast and Furious or animation, you know, we have two animation studios, Illumination and DreamWorks. And so under the umbrella of Universal, you have so many different types of projects. And, you know, 2023 saw, I mean, really successful movies that were very diverse. There was like Cocaine Bear mm -hmm. and there was Megan and there was, you know, Oppenheimer, and it really like ran the gamut of, you know, storytelling. And I think 
nowadays, particularly like, you know, you, you see that moviegoers, they want to see really cool stories. You know, the authenticity of everything is what people really, you know, gravitate towards. And like, if you're just making a movie because you're trying to, you know, you're trying to make money based on what you think is going Mm. to be popular, then I think people just really can smell that from a mile away. And so we really, I think the strength of Universal is really leaning into the fact that like, there's something for everybody, you know? Mm. Um, So that's what I really love about this company. And just like it's, it's commitment to, um, diversity, whether it's like our composers initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have initiatives for writers and directors. And, you know, there's also like a green initiative in terms of like making sure um, there's certain thresholds in terms of, you know, like being green. Um, <laughs> and I really feel like Universal doesn't just like talk the talk, it walks the walk. So, mm-hmm. you know, I really, I really do feel lucky to work at a company that holds it to a high standard like that yeah amazing amazing and as svp angela i'm sure you know for those listening in who might be a whether you're api or by poc looking to enter the industry but would love to pull the curtain back and what is sort of one segment of your day i know you're seeing all facets of the film start yeah. to end but uh What's what's some um, something like your average day like? That's a really good question because you know part of my job is really running point and day to day on all things music on my projects, right? So obviously it's like the film itself, like from you know like budgeting even before a film is greenlit, all the way through to like working with the filmmakers, working and hiring the comp- with and hiring composers, songwriters, music producers picking songs, you know, working on the soundtrack and working with, you know, a label partner, if that's the case, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, creating music videos for singles, Um, working with our marketing, you know, folks, Um, all the way through, though, to like franchise things like, so for instance, you know, I work on the Trolls franchise. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things associated with trolls like video games or consumer products or live entertainment like there was a live there was a live trolls touring show so i worked with our you know live events team to make sure that the music was really cohesive with the franchise um home entertainment so it really runs the gamut but just to give you an example of you know like a day um For instance, right now I'm working on an animated project that just got greenlit. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the budget because, you know, I do help with making deals as well. Like I work very hand in hand with with business affairs. So in terms of hiring this very exciting executive music producer for one of our animated films, um, you know, just looking at the budget to see how much we can pay this person and working with business affairs to really take a look at comps, you know, working with the filmmakers to, you know, even though it's very early, figure out what the scope of services are going to be and basically craft that deal. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously like tee it up with management Mm -hmm. or, you know, whoever we have to deal with. So that's like one aspect of, of my job. Another thing that I was working on today was, you know, we just finished shooting another film and so now we're entering post-production the music Mm -hmm. editor is starting Mm -hmm. um the director and his team you know like the picture editor they're putting together an assembly of everything that was shot to basically create a director's cut of the film which you know usually during a director's cut period the studio gives the filmmakers their own time to really put together Mm -hmm. what they want to first present you know it's a time where like we're hands off and I mean, we meaning the studio is hands off in terms of like notes and things like that. But Mm -hmm. as like the in-house music supervisor, I kind of play a different role. I'm not just the studio exec. I'm, you know, like the music supervisor that's helping. So, you know, I've been pulling together general compilations of music to feed to the director and the music editor. You know, we hired a composer really early, which is really great. Mm -hmm. So he started, you know, writing themes already, but you know, you still have to basically what they call temp um, a movie 
with existing score, right? Like, mm. and so that's really in and of itself its own kind of unique thing where the score hasn't been written yet. And so what we're doing is we're taking this composer's scores from previous films mm -hmm. and we are, you know, the music editor is going to use that to basically edit together I... a score for this assembly, right? right? right. So, you know, loading them up with lots of music. Um, I'm also working on... Um, a franchise thing with one of our animated franchises where there's going to be a Roblox game okay. with this franchise. And so I hired a composer to basically score the trailer. Um, and we did like a pitch meeting with, you know, our franchise people, Roblox mm -hmm. and the composer for them to really, you know, just show the composer what they've got and mm -hmm. then talk about what's needed. Um, so that's like an interesting thing where it's like a video game thing. Um, and I'm trying to think, I mean, I'm also finishing up another film where we are three weeks away from our final mix. Mm. And so everybody, like all the stakeholders of like the decision makers, the, you know, the, in, in this instance, the director, the producers, the studio and myself, we took a look at the latest version of the film which yeah. had the latest kind of, you know, songs that were big changes. And we all weighed in and discussed and, you know, decided how we were going to move forward with either keeping certain songs, replacing certain songs, mm -hmm. or, you know, like whatever in between. So that's kind yeah. of, yeah, that's a kind of snippet of the wide variety of stuff that I do. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, it's like every project is different, right? Mm -hmm. Like we could mm -hmm. be working on, something that is a musical and it's very on camera heavy and that has its own set of needs or something that's more straightforward and it's just score and you're working with the composer, there's no songs and it's a little bit more laid back and you're just kind of, you know, helping to oversee the composer and like, you know, the approval process when it comes to demos. So it's really just on a day-to-day -day basis, anything and everything that comes up. Never a dull moment, it no. sounds like, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> and to, to, to thread that needle, and I'm curious, so take, for example, the Fast and Furious franchise. Mm -hmm. So safe to say, when you work on the soundtrack, the decision process of what songs are going to go on the soundtrack, that's a whole nother creative process correct i mean songs that are used in the film and what goes on the soundtrack there could be some overlap there or there could not be yeah and i mean you know fast is one another executive worked on that but just in general when it comes to what goes on the soundtrack you know there's like lots of different iterations of it you know like if there's enough content mm -hmm. you know for instance i think about something like trolls or sing where you have so many cast performances yeah. that you, you know, can obviously make up a whole album's worth of just those cast performances. And then like, you know, if you have like, you know, for instance, on Trolls 3, we had the amazing in sync reunion song, you know, and so mm -hmm. like you can just have a soundtrack of that. There's mm -hmm. other instances where, you know, you have songs that are in the film right? Like original bespoke music. And then you've also got like inspired by tracks that, right. um, you know, you include basically working with a partner label and working with their artists and putting together music and bespoke songs that aren't necessarily in the film, but, you know, like I said, are inspired by. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really, you know, the thing about compilation albums you know i think there's always exceptions to the rule like i think about guardians of the galaxy right mm -hmm. that is a compilation soundtrack of existing songs that were licensed and it's a nice memento of like you know the film itself but you really don't see a lot of those because the thing is it's like it's not really original right like mm. you can get those songs you can stream those songs and put together your own version of the soundtrack and what we really do and look for when we're actually 
you know, thinking about doing a soundtrack is, um, you know, is there bespoke music that is very original to the project, right? Um, and that obviously is something that we discuss up front. I mean, obviously, if there's like a movie where it's like maybe two or three original songs, then you don't do a whole soundtrack. You do like an EP. So, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that um, I think back in the day, you did see a lot of like those compilation soundtracks, right? Like I was just yeah. thinking about, you know, like all the R&B, you know, like the the movies like Nutty Professor and like, Soul Food, you know, like there was a lot of stuff that was licensed. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays, I think when it comes to soundtracks, you need to have something that is really unique. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Angela, because like, you know, tip of the hat to say, looking at the soundtrack to Pulp Fiction. and Yeah, like, right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Or like uh, Baby Driver, right? Like, mm. I don't, you know, I don't know off the top of my head if there mm -hmm. was a soundtrack and if that was like a compilation, you know, like if it was a compilation. I would assume if there was, it would be that. So like I said, there's obviously like exceptions to the rule where, you know, you, you do take home like a memento of all the really cool music mm -hmm. that you heard in a movie. Um, but for the most part, I think when you're really looking at, successful albums of late it's stuff that you know you really work on a spoke music from the ground up you write and like record it for the film you look at scenes you know like you bring in artists things like that the, that's what really i think is the most successful right now the trend so i guess 100 percent, and safe to say angela you know looking back at your career from starting at miramax dimension films and going into trailers being a yeah. music supervisor at universal would you say the culmination of your previous experience has led you and prepared you to this moment as svp yeah i mean for sure the thing is it's like you know when i first started out <laughs> i you know i got lucky in that when I was looking for intern internships at USC, it was like Miramax films. I mean, when I was, you know, like on the job boards or whatever, it was Miramax and all these other random, you know, like, you know, companies. I think it would have been very different if it was like record labels, publishers, and then Miramax. But like that, especially mm. in its heyday, mm. it was really amazing. And so I started working there. And, you know, throughout my career, I really wanted to really see the different facets of music supervision. So I spent a little time at NBC working specifically in promos after Miramax, which was like really crazy because like <laughs> culturally, you know, mm. social, I mean, like company culture was very, very different. You go from like a super indie kind of like film, you know, mini studio to a super corporate place like NBC yeah. and on top of that promos right where it's like very much like you know what is the most um recognizable song slash artist you can use right mm -hmm. um then I went to a trailer house where at Ignition and headed the music department there and you know trailers are its own beast um and then you know ending up at Universal it's like everything that I've worked on mm -hmm. and really at all of those different companies, particularly at Miramax where I did everything from like licensing mm -hmm. to overseeing score production to, you know, um, doing the creative, obviously working with marketing, doing a lot of like publicity awards campaigns mm -hmm. um, for like the original song and, you know, like um, score campaigns um, you know, like really running the gamut of like everything. Obviously now when I'm overseeing every facet of, you know, the music on a project and working with different people, composers, mm -hmm. marketing people, um, you know, producers, um, all of that, everything that I've done, you know, in the past mm -hmm. obviously has like helped me to where I am now. So, you know, it's obviously that much easier to be able to oversee and work with like the licensing people when I've done it myself yeah. too. Um, right. And so like really kind of like rolling up your sleeves and like doing the job mm -hmm. of everything mm -hmm. makes overseeing it obviously that much 
easier. And, you know, even working with our marketing folks that come, a lot of them come from the vendor world. Mm -hmm. Um, They just, I don't know. I remember when I first started working at Universal and they found out that I worked at Ignition. It was almost like a sort of kind of like, okay, yeah, you're in the club. You know what it's like (laughs) to be in our world and what we need because it's like, it's it's very different. You know, TV, promos, major studio films, indie studio, you know, indie films. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, everything has its own process and, um, you know, it just, it's just that much easier when, when you've kind of worked in all of it. So I feel really lucky having done a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. And managing, cause I could imagine by now, Angela, you know, when you're building your team, you can immediately recognize strengths and weaknesses in your personnel, who's fit for what job, right. attention to detail, or, and, and, and it's like building that, that uh, NBA star team of, uh, yeah. Yeah. cause every, it's all hands on deck with, with huge productions. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, like I said, we work on movies of all shapes and sizes. So mm-hmm. it's like the good thing about our, you know, our team is that like, we all, bring different strengths to the table. Mm -hmm. And so even when we are dividing projects up, you know, between myself and like the few other creative execs, it's like, you know, who has a relationship with this filmmaker or who's really good with this type of music or who's really good, you know, with this type of, I don't know, like project, whether it's like on camera heavy, you know, things like that, or like bespoke soundtrack heavy. So I think, you know, it obviously really helps when we can kind of you know, mix and match like the creatives that are working on a project Mm -hmm. so that we can really, um, you know, cater to the needs of of the film because that's really what it is. It's like, you know, we serve the film and the filmmakers Mm -hmm. and, you know, even though it's like in a perfect world, you would, you know, you would love to have a song that's written for a film that ends up being like a huge single on the radio and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's still ultimately first and foremost has to work for the film. And so, you know, it, it does get a little difficult when, you know, we're working with, sometimes marketing or like our label partners where like the agenda is different, right? Mm -hmm. Like marketing's agenda is to really like, you know, bring in people and put butts in seats and sell tickets. Right. And like songs that are made for films that are supposed to like do what it needs to do for like the scene, like doesn't necessarily do that for marketing or like it doesn't necessarily have like the popular trend of what's like, a single on the radio, you know, particularly like, you know, if you've got hip hop and I remember it really, it's like, you know, hip hop at the time when like everything was slower and it was a lot of trap and it was just like, you know, we still need stuff that's like, there's energy. Right. Mm. And so kind of consolidating that is like really, really tough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we always have to remind our partners, whoever it is that like, we serve the film. You know, and so yeah, that's like that's why it's like when when it does check a lot of boxes, it's like lightning in a bottle, and Mm. that's the best of what you can hope for. So you know, it's not it's few and far between, but when it does happen, it's really amazing. Well, Angela, that is the perfect setup because culturally, the concurrent release of Barbie and Oppenheimer begin. Gave birth to, so to speak, of, let me get it right. Is It, it was Barbenheimer? Folks yeah, seeing... it was Barbenheimer. Yeah. yeah so t- I would love to hear, was that just something organic? That decision? Yeah, really... no, it was organic. It was wow. super organic. <laughs> and like, I, you know, like, I don't want to misspeak in terms of like where it first began, like, you know, mm-hmm. within social media. But, you know, that is a perfect example of how like, you know, there is a desire for really original well, not ori- I mean, obviously Barbie's not original, but like, you know, unique content, right? Like, yeah. I don't know that in another time, a three hour movie about a scientist, right? <laughs> like would have been high on people's lists and for it to be, you know, a number one movie, but yeah. between you know, people's affinity for Chris Nolan and I mean, even Ludwig, you know, everything that kind of like 
was part of that film and it just being a really good, great film and story. Um, and, you know, people wanting to see a really interesting interpretation of what Barbie, you know, mm-hmm. means to people nowadays and Greta Gerwig's interpretation of it, yeah. which I think yeah. was really amazing. And, you know, like definitely kind of called out certain things and did it really well and tastefully. I think, you know, it's just two really good examples of the fact that like really great stories can coexist yes. and people will come out in droves to see these movies, you know, like it was yeah. really fascinating. Um, and then the phenomenon of like people watching both and like, I don't know, it was, mm-hmm. it was really crazy. Yeah. Cause I think that's unprecedented, you know, that's cause I remember watching, you know, access Hollywood. It was just on all the reality, not reality, but the, um, Talk shows are talking about the phenomena and the soundtrack yeah. to Barbie. I mean, obviously, I mean, yeah. You know, kudos to Warner Brothers and Kevin Weaver and Atlantic, and yeah, it, it really, it really was amazing. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. So, taking a step into a current topic of artificial intelligence, uh, if you want to weigh in on what we're seeing with AI and how that might uh-huh. impact uh, composers or artists in general. Yeah, I mean, you know, we still have yet to see a lot of it. I mean, you know, in terms of like within the songwriting world anyways, um, I know we touched upon it a little bit during our other panel, but, you know, it is starting to make its way into my world in that, you know, for instance, I was creating something I needed to get demos together for a specific recording artist. And so I went out to a bunch of producers, gave them the brief and, you know, it was really easy for them to basically get AI vocals of this recording artist and Mm -hmm. like laid the vocals down in his voice. Right. So it obviously made it that much easier for, you know, people to envision what it was going to sound like. Um, Mm. so, you know, we talked a little bit on the panel about, you know, what that, what AI means in terms of temp score, you know, with, for composers and films. Um, I have yet to see that. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. And I still think ultimately when it comes to songwriting, nothing really can beat the magic and the unique touch of a like, you know, real people getting together, you know, like I think maybe it would be good for like the start of an idea, things like that, but it's not something I think that can really solely do the job of songwriters, Mm -hmm. producers, right. You know what I mean? Like, so I think maybe more of an aid, but not something that you can rely on and hopefully people aren't going to be like fully replaced. You know what I mean? So mm. knock on wood. I don't know. Knock we'll, see. <laughs> we'll see. Knock on wood. Yeah. Fingers crossed. And it's going to be yeah. interesting. And, you know, I'll have to get a, uh, a business or a music lawyer into way yeah. because with AI, the concept that whatever goes into the algorithm AI is based on existing works. Right. So is there going to be copyright issues? So that, right. could, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure. Time will tell. It's, yeah, it's, time it's, will tell. Yeah. I mean, Scarlett Johansson was on the news. It was, right. There was, you know, her voice was uh, through an AI app. And so that's, it's fascinating. So we'll keep an eye on that. But, um, you know, one sort of piece of advice as we, you know, look to, the future of the industry, whether it's film, entertainment, music, for AEPIs, you know, internships, mentorships, we've talked about. But mm-hmm. was there anything that we didn't cover that you would want to touch on that you would say, hey, you know, this is one thing in your toolkit to to make sure you, you uh, do your homework on? You know, I think it's really important to really lean into, like, who you are regardless of like ethnicity or, you know what I mean? Like, I know it's just like such a buzzword for like authenticity, but I think 
that when you really know what your strengths are, um, what your weaknesses are, um, and really tap into, you know, letting those parts of you shine. I think that's really when I think it, it can be the most um, fruitful and successful, you know, um, particular, particularly when, you know, it's early on in your career and you're, you're trying to figure out what you want to do. I think, you know, I, I do a lot of generals and talk to a lot of interns or people just starting out in their career after graduating. And, you know, like, film and TV or like music industry, it's like the entertainment industry. It's just such a huge, you know, place and it can be really overwhelming. And, you know, especially if like, you know, you don't have experience in every facet of it, but I think it's really important. Like I said, to like, really think about what you're good at, whether it's like, are you really social? And like, you know, like maybe, you know, like, a career in like pitching music or like marketing or, you know, you know, that sort of thing maybe, or being an agent would be, you know, really good. Or are you really organized and do you love paperwork and like mm -hmm. budgets and like numbers and things like that. And so maybe publishing is something that like you would be really good at or like, you know, obviously the easy thing, it's like, if you really love music and, you know, it's not even just about loving music, but like really having a passion about lots of different types of music and really knowing about trends and, you know, songs and producers, then maybe music supervision is the way to go. So I think that really, and also I always tell a lot of people too, it's like when you're applying to companies for whatever it is, internships, whatever, really take a look at like the company culture, right? Because, you know, I've talked about like all the different places that I've worked, right? Mm -hmm. If you're working at a big corporate place versus a small boutique agency versus, you know, like a management company or everything in between, um, you know, thinking about like working at a place like Netflix or Amazon, which is more like tech culture versus an old school studio like Warner Brothers or Universal, where it is really kind of like really corporate, you know, like and mm. everything has its like, you know. It's it's culture and yeah. it's way of working. And I think that is really, really important to consider when you are like applying to to jobs, right? Like yeah. and when you're in those interviews, asking questions like, you know, what is your company culture like? You know, yes. what kind of, you know, what do you like what is diversity? you know, what role does diversity play, you know, and things like that, or even just talking about like, what do you love about your job? And what do you, you know, wish could change? Like, I think, you know, really getting into the nitty gritty of like that kind of stuff will really give you a better idea of the type of company and like, you know, job that you would be jumping into, you know, so I think that's really important to think about when you're first starting out particularly i couldn't agree more really important there because you know in the 90s when it's at capital records like you said every label has its own personality right and the indie vibe and same with with the bookends you know of film television and to end on a fun note i'm just curious is there anything that's on repeat at the moment uh in your 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 cue your Spotify playlist or your disco account, any new music? Um... Mm, I, you know, I haven't gotten through the whole thing, but I started listening to the Childish Gambino album. That's mm. really, that's been really interesting. Um, I really love the new Beyonce album. <laughs> um, I'm also like a, like a creature of like old school, you know, like I was like, okay, I want to go back and like, listen to like Grateful Dead or, you know, things like that. Like, so I kind of, if you, it's interesting because if you look at like, you know, how Spotify will spit out like, you know, top mm -hmm. things that you listen that to throughout the year. Usually my stuff is like catalog stuff. It's like nineties R and B or hip hop or, you know, like, I don't know, you know, it's, or like two thousands, like indie rock things like that or like lcd sound system you know yeah. i'm always like going back to you know 
the the tried and true like artists that I've always loved, but obviously need to like keep up with with like what's going on out there. And I mean, it's interesting too, because I mm-hmm. feel like when I work on projects, I'm very focused on whatever the genre is of music, right? Like, yeah. and so for something like Trolls, it's very much like catalog and covers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm just finishing up, you know, a movie with John Woo, which is very exciting. He's doing a remake of you know, his seminal film, The Killer, and it's set in Paris. So I've been listening to a lot of like French music. Oh. Um, you know, I was just listening to like Stromae and Gasoffelstein and um, L'Imperatrice and, you know, like, so it's like, it, it, it is a luxury for me when I'm able to actually sit down and listen to, you know, usually contemporary music, because a lot of the, for some reason, the films that I work on, it's like, I don't know, these filmmakers want older things or it's very genre specific and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I welcome the time when I can actually catch up on new music. Yeah. Catch up on new music and have bandwidth where at the end of your day, the last thing you, you go home, you're like, I can't hear any any music. No yeah. more inputs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like okay, let me put on a podcast. That's what I do. Like when I'm like driving home, I listen to Smart List. I need like a little bit of a break from like music. <laughs> from music. I'll I'll share with I'll send it to you via email. But someone hit me to a you know it's an app. It's like by by neural beats or it's just white Ooh. noise. So yeah, you can, yeah, it's just it's like a palate cleanser. Oh my god! Yes, one hundred percent to wind down but uh thanks as always angela the time flies by and yeah thanks for having me really great chat and um here's the rest of the year and um thank you so much and as always um we'll continue the chat there's always we're always a fan of all your amazing work and thanks again angela for stopping by thank you with that, guys, uh, we'll catch you next week on Sync Riffs. And thanks again to Angela Leas, SVP at Universal Films. And we'll catch you on the other side. Namaste. Go.